Hello, welcome to today's devotion. We are in the Gospel of Luke. We're looking specifically today at chapter 20, verses 27 through 40, and Jesus talking about the resurrection. So let's get into it, and before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him for guidance and for uh, for wisdom. Thank you, Father, for your word that reveals truth that we can find no other place. And as we go into your word, Lord, please open our hearts and minds that we may be able to know your truth and walk in your truth and the freedom and joy and peace and strength and hope that is in your word. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting with verse 27, we read the following. Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came up and questioned him, him being Jesus. Teacher, Moses wrote for us, that if a man's brother has a wife and dies childless, his brother should take the wife and produce offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. Also, the second and the third took her. In the same way, all seven died and left no children. Finally, the woman died too. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For all seven had married her. Jesus told them, The children of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to take part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they can no longer die because they are like angels and are children of God, since they are children of the resurrection. Moses even dictated in the passage about the burning bush that the dead are raised, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, because all are living to him. Some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, and they no longer dared to ask him anything. Well, this is a very um, poignant, direct, and existential question issue, topic, if you will. I remember, before we get into it, I had I grew up in church my whole life. Every Sunday, confirmed, etc. Went to a Lutheran college, etc. But when I moved to California, 22, it was a world that I just foreign to me. It was almost like an amusement park. It was so beautifully spectacular, different, different, beautiful and spectacularly different. And, um, but there was a gnawing question in my mind. Always has been. Because I knew that even though I was starting my career at 22, and if my intention were to play out where I would be a teacher the rest of my life, eventually... I would have to face my mortality. Eventually, I would have to face death. Most people simply try to put it off, pretend. I can pretend from time to time too. Most people prefer not to think about it, which is a rather odd 
mental maneuver to find oneself in because it's the one thing that all of us have to face. Nobody gets out of it. Death is the one thing. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter if you come from a well-to-do family or not. Doesn't matter what kind of education you have. Death is the final equalizer. And it doesn't matter what religion you are. Death is a reality for everyone. And I remember in that first year of teaching that it began to become more prevalent in my thinking. Especially of the fact that when I was teaching in, in the third month I was in Hollister, the bass drummer, one of the bass drummers that was in the band was raped and killed. And it was a big to do in Hollister at that time. Death was front and center. And they brought in counselors and so forth, but nobody can counsel you through death without some kind of insight and spiritual hope. So anyway, as I was having to deal with this and the number of things that happened when I first moved to Hollister, there was on one occasion coming back from a band competition, I was sitting next to a woman, parent of a, one of the kids was in band. And for whatever reason, I simply asked her, she was, you know, had a kid that was in ninth grade. So she had to be in her forties at least, I'm assuming. And I said, what do you think happens when you die? I asked her this question because she was older than me. We don't talk about these things really all that much. And I had developed a rapport with her that I felt she would be honest and forthright with me. And she was. And she said, I don't think anything happens. I think it's just done. And I said, what do you mean just done? And she said, just like a light bulb. It just goes out and you're done. And that answer terrified me so much because if that's the case, if that's true, then what's the point of all this? There is no point. And if there's no point, there's also no, no right or wrong because right or wrong by its very nature will have consequences that surpass our lifespan. And it brought me into a place in, of increasing desperation really to know this answer. And I believe it was part of the Holy Spirit moving me to the experience I had a year or so later where the Lord revealed himself in the most beautiful, powerful way. But that has always stuck with me. I was 22 when that happened. I'm just now turning, turned 58. It's been a long time, but I've never forgot it because it was so, imp just it imprinted itself in my psyche and in my spirit. So, here we are talking or reading what we have just read. And I like to reiterate some of the th main characters, if you will, or the people that are in this particular account of Jesus' ministry. Sadducees were a religious group that were in power when Jesus was ministering. It wasn't a big group. And they focused primarily around the temple. And they were primarily a group that was defined by family relations. If your family was an upper family in, in Jerusalem, one of the elites, the priests, etc., you'd be a Sadducee. Outside of Jerusalem, they didn't have that much pull. But one of their key tenets was that there is no resurrection. That once you die, that's it. What happens after that, we don't know. And the resurrection is an idea or a revelation of spiritual truth that goes all the way back to the oldest book that we have in the Bible, which is the book of Job. And in that 
account of Job. He says, even though I die in my flesh, I will see God. It's the beginning of this revelation that Job was given that no, there is something substantially more than just this part of our existence. And that not only is there life after death, but there is going to be a new life that will be physical as well, but not in the same way, not with the same properties that we have in this world. It will be qualitatively different. And even though the word resurrection is not used in the book of Job, the revelation of it, the idea of it, the glimpse of it, the prophetic notion of it is there. And it begins to work its way through, as Jesus pointed out, when Moses experienced the living God, the Lord, in the burning bush and referred to him, God referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He revealed he is not the God of the dead, and therefore Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still living, even though they may not be with us in the physical realm. This is the point that Jesus makes out. And the powerful thing about this is, is if you don't believe in the resurrection, if you don't believe that there's anything in the afterlife, the story of the man who dies and all of his brothers also marrying his wife and having no kids becomes a very interesting legal question, theological question. What happens? But when a line of questioning is built on a false premise, a false foundation, it doesn't matter because whatever, hap whatever is the answer from that false foundation will not be true. So Jesus corrects them and says, not only is God the God of the living, but he also gives us insight into what will take place in the resurrection. And in verse 34, he tells them, the children of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to take part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. And that is, from our standpoint, so foreign because our society, the world that we live in and the history that we know of, as far back as we can find without the spiritual revelation of scripture has to deal with marriage, how it's practiced, how it was played out, etc. But in each case, what I find interesting is that the marriage vows that we used to say very frequently, I don't know if it's used as frequently, but we would say for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health until death us do part. That is the defining moment when we are no longer married because death takes that commitment and ends it. You can't follow your spouse into the next world, if you will. And Jesus is saying, because there's no death in the resurrection, there is no marriage. It's something that puzzles you, you know, but it's, it's a revelation that Jesus gives with regards to that age. We're going to get into that a little bit more next time when we take a look at the resurrection, because it's a, it's a, it is the foundational hope of our faith. And without an understanding of the resurrection, we really are incomplete in terms of our understanding of who God is and understanding our destiny and understanding reality. So we're going to get into that more next time. But in the meantime, I hope that this devotion was meaningful to you. And I hope that you find assurance and hope and power and strength and joy in the fact that the resurrection 
is a reality and that our destiny in the resurrection is glorious. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.